What do wars, power, politics, and territories have in common? One thing, and it's called geopolitics. Geopolitics has often been defined as the relation of global political power that adheres to the geographical system. If we try to find the origin of the term geopolitics, it was first employed by the Swedish social scientist Rudolf Kellen, whose idea formed today's well-known perspective of a connection between region to region. Welcome to the Wealth Lab, and thanks for checking in. While many theorists, politicians, and critics have been trying to discern that geopolitics isn't at play today, it very well is. Even though these theorists might have a degree of truth to their claims, considering there is no apparent resistance of powers today. However, we can tell from the Cold War's disintegration, and many other wars, that a lot was going on behind the scenes. Although geopolitics was deemed a fascist science by most nations and critics, several geopolitical institutions were carefully planning geopolitical strategies. Today, geopolitics and everything surrounding it might seem fictitious, but it is very real. Have you ever thought about why nations are expanding their feet on the ground? Have you ever thought about why there's been a war for centuries around the Arab Spring? Have you ever thought about why Eurasia, or Europe in particular, has been a magnet for wars? It's hard to ignore, but it all points towards territory and geopolitics. And to start this video, we'll be discussing the geopolitical theories, how they're affecting the world today, and how they operate in the world explored before us. Enjoying this video so far? Hit the like and subscribe button, thanks! Let's get back to the video. Interestingly, over the last few centuries, geopolitical theorists have proposed three theories portraying how to control the world from a geographical perspective. The main theories were the Heartland Theory, raised by Halford John Mackinder, the Sea Power Theory, raised by Alfred Taylor Mahan, and the Rimland Theory, raised by Nicholas John Spikeman. Let's start with the first theory, the Heartland Theory. In 1904, an editorial was submitted by British geographer Halford John Mackinder to the Royal Geographical Society. He was referred to as a British political geographer, who was noted for his work as a lecturer and his political conceptions of the world divided into two camps. In his article, The Geographical Pivot of History, he states that whoever controls Eastern Europe controls the heartland. His article majorly supported the concept of world dominance. However, a more revised version of his work explains that whoever controls the heartland controls the globe island. Now you might be wondering, where exactly is the heartland? It's simple, yet complicated. Today, the heartland lies in the middle of the globe island, stretching from the Yangtze to the Volga, and from the Himalayas to the Arctic. Mackinder speculated that control over Eurasia would ensure control over the heartland, control over the heartland would ensure control over the world island, and control over the world island would solidify power over the world. Interestingly, many have criticized Mackinder's theory for several reasons. However, others are reconsidering their plausibility and ongoing importance today. It is evident that the heartland's perceived importance often has been reflected with the geopolitics of countries such as China, the United States of America, Russia, and several others today. At the beginning of the 21st century, the geopolitical situation gave a brand new boost to studies of the regional structuralizing principles for the entire Eurasian continent's geopolitical and geoeconomic space. Mackinder was the primary one who discerned that the heartland was within the most advantageous geopolitical location. In other words, at all stages of the heartland's development, especially today, Eastern Europe still remains a spatial element of its structure. However, today that perspective has become more of a symbolic term. What do you think the heartland is today? If we take Mackinder's article, Russia would be the leading suspect for the heartland theory. It wouldn't be wrong in the least, since it happens to be right on top of the actual heartland. Considering the Soviet Union, it spread like wildfire from its original position into Eastern Europe and downwards. The power was unparalleled until the Soviet Union fell. However, the heartland today is at the heart of every nation. 
The Heartland is the territory that allows you to control your country. It is the territory that ensures control over the nation's heart, the primary resources, the exports, and the population. And control over the heart of the nation simply solidifies your power over the country. Ringing any bells? Do you have territories that can be classified as heartlands in your nation? Eerie, isn't it? How geography can influence who practices power and who doesn't? The next geopolitical theory we have is the sea power theory. Now, what is the sea power theory? The background of this theory has an unconventional start. The sea power theory was suggested by Alfred Thayer Mann, who theorized his sea power concept while reading a history book in Peru. Later in 1890, Mahan, the United States Naval War College president, published his book called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. His book was a revolutionary analysis of naval power's influence as a factor in the British Empire's rise. Later, he came out with more books discerning the influence of sea power during different empires. Enjoying the video? Hit the like and subscribe button. Thanks. Now let's get back to the video. So why did Mayan's theory spread like wildfire and stand the test of time? Now, the 1890s weren't stable times for the world, especially the United States. The 1890s were heavily affected by social and economic unrest throughout the nation as the economic depression laid its dark clouds over the country. This is why Alfred Thayer Mann's teachings and theories were so celebrated among leading intellectuals and politicians. Studies suggest that Alfred Thayer Mann was the one who had influenced sea power upon history. His work connected with people concerned by the political and economic challenges of the 1890s and the decline of the Americas. So what is the sea power theory about? Now let's discuss what that theory refers to. Majorly, he argued that the navy was essential to ascertain global military and economic dominance. Also, it had been all about the communication system between the different regions or continents. Mayen was the one who always wanted to compete with powerful European countries as he wanted to represent his state as more robust and advanced. In the book, he mentioned the importance of sea capability and he said that England's economy and politics have become much greater only thanks to control of the seas. Now does the centuries old sea power theory still hold today? Mayen's theories continue to influence the 21st century especially in developing naval powers like India and China in today's era. China is the one that is focusing considerably upon the sea power theory. They are giving it importance now, and they are looking at it as a dominant way to rule over the continents. Since the last decade, China has been actively emphasizing its projects, and their economy is growing day by day. What do you think? Is your nation doing the same? Before you answer that, let's head on to the last of the main geopolitical theories that influenced the rise of man's power. The Rimland Theory The Rimland Theory was theorized by Nicholas John Spikeman, an American social scientist and was among the classical realist school founders in American foreign policy. He was vital in providing an essential source of transmitting Eastern European political thoughts to America. Before we get into the specifics of the theory, Let's try to understand the Rimland, and what does that mean? Rimland is a concept championed by Nicholas John Spikeman to explain the maritime fringe of a rustic or a continent, specifically the densely populated western, southern, and eastern edges of the Eurasian continent. His Rimland theory frequently proposed that Eurasia's Rimland, the coastal areas, is the key to success, and success was by controlling the world island. Whoever would control the Rimland would eventually control the World Island, and whoever controlled the World Island would soon control the world. His theory was substantially influential, mainly during the conflict. Now, where is this Rimland located? Rimland is in between the Heartland and the Marginal Seas, so it was more critical than Heartland. It includes the Arabian Peninsula, Iran, Afghanistan, Southeast Asia, China, Korea, and East Siberia except for Russia. All the countries described above lie in the buffer zone that is between sea power and land power. So how was the Rimland any different than the Heartland? Spikeman argued that landlocked states were victim to security challenges from their immediate neighbors. 
However, island states were a potential target to sea power. Spikeman suggested that offshore islands could approach their security challenges by conquering or colonizing a coastal area while maintaining a balance of power. However, landlocked states like the Heartland couldn't do much. Spikeman continued that the Rimland was the key to world domination. He added that the Rimland sea power and air power allowed it to dominate and contain the Heartland. Interestingly, Spikeman realized the strategic significance of a specific country that is very much at play today. His articulation seems prophetic since how accurate it was. And that country was China. Spikeman believed in China's geography and geopolitical importance. He visualized a modern, vitalized, militarized China that would threaten various coastal powers and the Western powers. What's more interesting, is that Spikeman predicted China's rise to power 200 years ago. He predicted that China's geographical position was going to be a threat to the US. What other countries do you think has the potential to become a superpower? What country do you think has an equal potential to being the next superpower like China? Here's a hint, this country has over 1 billion people. Enjoying the video? Hit the like and subscribe button. Thanks! Let's get back to the video. Closing thoughts. Today, the Belt and Road Initiative is said to be established on these three leading geopolitical theories. This is because the project comprises long sea passages, including those to Southeast Asia, and roads that pass through the heartland depicted by Mackinder. However, these geopolitical theories are limited to the time the theorists propose them. We should note that theories established on national decisions and international relations are naturally concrete depictions of the time they were theorized. Furthermore, we should emphasize that the birth and development of any geopolitical theory are dependent on time. Therefore, it's difficult to say these theories are still at play in the current era. I believe there's a whole new different theory at play today, established on controlling technology, surveillance, and data. But, after discussing all of these geopolitical theories, one thing is clear. Every theory was based on the hunger for ruling the world. The difference was that all three of them are descendant of how nations could become the absolute supremacy for other parts of the world. With that said, we can conclude that geopolitical theories that played a significant role in the previous era have more of a symbolic meaning today. Technological innovation is a crucial player in the modern era, and space has expanded significantly for human activities. Today, geopolitics isn't just studying the influence of geography, economics, and demographics. However, it has expanded to newer players such as technology and data. Scary, isn't it? I hope you guys enjoyed watching, and I'll see you in the next video.